Today, we will talk about the environmental laws and as you can see the title, the environmental laws when they started some 30, 35 years ago and with the time they have gone and become very stringent and it almost cover all aspects of our life and we have both responsibility towards the environmental laws and the obligation as well as we have certain rights. So, we will go through the journey which is basically the historical perspective to today's what conditions and what situation is there for the environmental laws. We will discuss that and the title is infancy to stringency. If you look at the first slide, the question comes up as to why we need the laws. When we understand the system of the environmental pollution or environmental uh, propagation of the pollution, transport of the pollution, we can say there are three things which are happening. There is a source, there is a transport mechanism, whether it could be water pollution or air pollution does not matter. The pollutants are transported through the medium and there is a receptor. What, if, what I mean by the receptor are the people, the ecology that is affected. So, there are three components of environmental uh, system whether it could be water pollution, air pollution, soil pollution, noise pollution, but there would be three components. Source is transport of the pollutant and it affects. So, when the effect is so severe as the people tend to suffer because of the pollution, well, we need to do the control and that is the direction of the control. And where it is control, for example, industry is causing pollution. So, the industry must control the pollution. But sometimes saying is not enough. Okay, we may ask in the industry to control, but there has to be certain rules, regulation, so industry is duty bound to control the pollution. So, we define what is the receptor, it could it be the ecology and the people. And when we do not need the laws, if there are like for example, if voluntarily the industry or the citizens or the people who are running the industry or running other pollution activities, they control the pollution on their own. Then we do not need so many laws, but obviously the certain laws are required for the for the pollution control and that is that has come through the societal response as a society tend to ask for more and more pollution control. So, then the environmental laws become very important component of the legal enforcement. So, laws are through the parliament that we can see that our parliament will make the laws and there will be a system or there will be a body, there will be a mechanism to uh, implement the laws. And in addition, the laws can be the national laws as we will see some of them and there could be international laws that we are, we have to follow and there could be treaties, there could be treaties between the two countries or there could be the treaties amongst many countries or several countries. So, and then there could be protocols that we need to follow. So, we will go through this journey in this lecture. And so, we go to the move to the next slide and look at the perspective of it why suddenly there was a need for the environmental laws. We look at the history there has been air, air pollution episodes have been reported. For example, suddenly because of the uh, poor weather conditions, dispersion was poor, there has been many episodes which caused very high level of pollution and that resulted in several deaths, injury and there could be some accidents as well. So, there is little examples I am giving here, Meuse Valley, Donora in Pennsylvania 1948, uh, Pozorica in Mexico 1950, London smoke, the very famous uh, and we will little bit discuss about this was in 1952, several thousand people died because of the pollution problem in 1952, serious problem. And similarly in, 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 in Japan in 1956, uh, there was a uh, pollution caused because of the methyl mercury pollution in a Minamata Bay and that resulted into the severe uh, injuries and the, and the damage as well as the deaths that was in 1956. And then also again in Japan as the industries were growing in 1959, there was many people suffered from asthma and in fact that asthma become famous and the asthma got the name itself is Yokoichi asthma. Yokoichi was a place or a city in Japan. It is obviously, if the, such a situation exists, we need to control the pollution because the, the basic fundamental requirement or fundamental objective or the fundamental um, purpose for the pollution control engineers is to provide good and good and better public health to the people. 
So, the second thing what you are seeing here on the screen, okay, these are the mostly the responses to the environmental problems. So, what were the ref responses? People tend to form the regulation. For example, the Clean Air Act was in response to 1952 London smoke. Water quality conservation law came in Japan in 1958. US federal air pollution legislation came in 1985. US EPA, a very important agency which does a lot of research and makes environmental laws is was formed in United States in 1970. And also in, in the US again, Clean Air Act in the United States was amended in 1990 to account for uh, pollution control even for the very uh, other toxic compounds as well. So, this little history we see that the man, mankind has been responding, the governments have been responding to the pollution. So, let us see this was a little historical thing what has happened or the, or, or the, so in, in certain countries in the world, but let us see uh, what, what exactly had happened in London smoke. You see a picture on your screen, you essentially see it was during the month of early week of December that was in 1952. This was the See here this uh, suddenly during the 3rd or 4th of December, the pollution started rising that you can see the green uh, uh, green thing, green line or the green graph that was the sulphur dioxide as you can see here. Okay. So, both suddenly in London, sulphur dioxide started going up, so was the smoke, the dot you see here and the levels of both of them as you see on this side screen okay, that at the peak time it was like 2, two milligram per meter cube of sulfur dioxide, which is very, very high. And you see it started affecting the people and the, the, the red line what you see is the number of deaths and number of deaths is given on this, this side. Okay. And there was a norm, this was a normal death rate okay, per day in the London city and then you see because of the pollution people started suffering and it really caused the death apart from the injuries. Um, and this is a picture uh, taken from the London smoke from the BBC site. And then you can imagine like how pollution can cause very serious problems. So, we need to control and we need to control and we have to have a legal system that would be enforced and so industries need to follow, the individual people have to follow, the vehicle, vehicle owners have to follow, how to clean, keep the vehicles clean. So, these things become very important. So, this, this lecture today is for the environmental laws. Let us see what is environmental laws in India, then we will discuss a journey through past and what are the laws that we have today. In the constitution, every citizen okay, need to do certain, uh, they are duty bound to do certain things as per the article 15 G that states for citizens of India is, it shall be the duty of every citizen of India to protect and improve the natural environment including forests, lakes, rivers and wildlife and to have compassion for the living creatures. So, that is we are all are duty bound about to keep the environment clean. It is not only that every citizen is duty bound, the constitution also cast a duty on the states. So, every state as per the article 48 A which was 42nd amendment, it cast a duty on every state in the directive principles of our constitution. Uh, the state policy for taking the steps for the protection and the improvement of the environment. So, state also need to do everything what it takes to clean up the environment for the better public health and a better living which is in, uh, in unison with the environmental conditions. So, how the government acted on the whole thing, what is in the fourth five year plan that was first time the environmental pollution was talked about in India. So, the environmental dimensions and planning and development was considered. They said, well, we, we cannot leave the environment alone and so in the planning process, in the development process, the environment should come. In the same, uh, during the same period, Pitambar Panth committee was formed to prepare the India's country paper on human health as I have written here and you can see on your screen. And then after that, a committee was formed which was a very important committee when it came to the uh, devising and developing the environmental laws in the country was the National Committee on Environmental Planning and Coordination that was formed in 1972. And a very historical conference was held where the state head of many countries they participated and then 
they discussed as to how all over the world environmental protection uh, should be should become a law and how to go about this one. So, the very extremely important conference was held in that is called UN Conference on Human Environment and that was held in Stockholm in Sweden in 1972. And that is what the, the basic thing that came out from that conference was preservation of the natural resources and the um, preservation of environmental quality, both the resources as, as well as the quality. This interesting thing that came out from this the conference was very interestingly known as PPP principle or it is called the pollution, polluter pays principle. So, if you are polluting, I mean you got to pay for it. So, you cannot get away uh, by polluting scot free and you need to do something about this. So, in fact, it was the follow up of the Stockholm conference that government of India, our, our government decided to enforce certain laws. So, first uh, law that came into which was exclusively for the environmental control that came into being in 1974 and that, that, that act which or the law that came into being was called Water Pollution Prevention and Control Act 1974. In fact, under this provision of the law, state pollution control boards and central pollution control was formed so that the environmental laws can be implemented when we have a, a mechanism to implement the environmental laws. That was in 1980, Department of Environment was formed and by the time the, 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 the work of the Department of Environment grew so much as that, that in 1985, the de Department of Environment was upgraded to full fledged ministry at the government of India. So, this is a little brief, brief history more of the um, as to how uh, the government institutions thought about the environmental uh, the problems and how they acted onto this one. Well, we will try to get the most specific thing. Here, there are the three main bodies in the country which deals with the environmental pollution and the environment in general. Okay. At the central government level, we have the Ministry of Environment and Forest. Again, at the central level, we have the Central Pollution Control Board and at the state, which implements the environmental law on pollution control is a state pollution control board. What you can see here is the, the environmental policy and planning is done at this at the central government level. Central pollution control board is an advisory agency to the government of India as you can see here as I am trying to underline advise the central, go central government on the matters concerning prevention, control and abatement of water and air pollution. Similarly, the state pollution control boards uh, implement the laws in the state. Let us also quickly see what kind of mechanism these have. So, these are the mechanism for the pollution control in India what we have. We have the central government at the federal level. Okay. We have the state government at the state level. So, at the, central, at the central government level, we have the Ministry of Environment and Forest. Under that, there are many agencies and many um, other, um, uh, pa, uh, other uh, organs the ministry has to deal with the pollution. But the important thing is, is the Central Pollution Control Board, which is concerning largely with the pollution control. Because environmental aspects, there are many aspects of the environment and pollution control is one of them. So, we will focus here is that of the pollution control. The Central Pollution Control Board is, a, is an advisory body for government of India and it also has its journal offices spread all over the country. Similarly, at the level of the state government, the state department or state ministry of the environment that is here. It also has a state pollution control board which at which interact with the uh, uh, state level ministry and it also has the regional offices as you can see here. And the state pollution control board and the central pollution control board has a very close link. Okay. And then they interact on the environmental laws and implementation and the enforcement of the laws. So, this is the in very brief this is the mechanism of the enforcement of environmental laws concerning pollution control in the country. Let us quickly uh, go and see the many environmental laws that we need to understand 
and we need to follow. It could, you could be an industrialist, you could be ordinary citizens using the environmental resources. So, there is a duty, there is a law for everyone. So, probably it is little difficult to go through all the laws as you see on the screen, but the first law or the act that came was in 1974, okay, that is called the Water Act or the Water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act that came into came into being in 1974. Some of the laws and rules we will discuss as we go by in this lecture and it will become more clear, but of course, environmental laws is a such a subject in itself that it is probably difficult to cover through one lecture. So, briefly we will going over to certain issues and these laws can be checked at the website of the ministry or, or of the central pollution control board if you need to go into the details. Okay, so, we will discuss a little bit about the Water Act that came in 1974. Essentially, it focused on to the control, abate and prevent water pollution and to preserve as well as restore the national water quality. So, one of the, the major um, objectives set in this uh, Water Act 1974 was to develop the water quality standards. What we mean by the water quality standards is the standards of the water quality in terms of the various parameters which should be uh, what kind of water, water quality should be in the river, the lakes, the ground water and, uh, um, and other environmental resources. So, the objective was to set the, the standards. So, that once we have the standard then we can compare the things and can decide what action needs to be taken. Similarly, the, 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 the key words was polluter pays, okay, command and control and of the pipe treatment that became the focus for all the industries and in fact, even for the municipal supplies, uh, waste water is generated in each city and that needs to be controlled. And why we call it end of the pipe treatment is that when it is discharged, when it is about to be discharged into the water body or onto the land, there must be some treatment done. So, that is called end of the pipe treatment. Okay. When we talk about the responsibilities, that is responsibility largely which I am referring here is to the industries. Let us write that one. Okay. Every industry which is water polluting should obtain a consent, that is very important word before even the industry is going to start the business, before they are even going to put their foundation stone, what is required is that they obtained a consent or in short form I can say a no objection certificate that industry can certainly come at the place where they intend to come. And in the when they are getting such kind of NOC as I have written here, no objection certificate, they need to demonstrate as to kind of technology they have is a clean technology, they have to demonstrate the waste water or that would come out from the industry will be properly treated and it will not have the adverse impacts onto the receiving water body. So, that is very important that even before the industry is, is it, it comes up, they need to take a permission, they need to take a consent. So, that it is right in the beginning before the industry comes up, it is kind of uh, guaranteed that industry will be a will be an environmental friendly industry. So, that is very important step. So, legally all the industries which are or all the people who are planning to have an industry, they rather go to the to the pro proper authorities and provide enough information that their, their industry is a clean process and it will not cause any harmful impact on the receiving water bodies or receiving the environment or to the people and then they can get get a go ahead and then they can start construction. Well, it does not end there because once the industry is ready before the production can start, they must obtain the another consent okay, and that consent is called consent to operate okay, that is under specified under section 21. And when the industry goes asking for the consent to operate because essentially what the industry is saying that well our industry is ready or we are about to start the production or we are about to start the operation of the industry. So, in that case they again need a consent or permission from the government and the government can put 
or lay down certain conditions and those conditions are called the constant conditions, okay. especially on the discharge standards as to how much is the water quantity that you can discharge and how much is the pollutants that can be allowed to discharge. Because it is in certain cases it may be possible to have the zero discharge or zero pollution, but certain industries you know they will be using lot of water and zero discharge and zero pollution sometimes can be very, very difficult although one has to try every time to improve the situation. And then uh, this constant thing which I am trying to emphasize more and more is the constant thing is not just one time business. A constant needs to be re renewed every time within that certain time frame specified by the, by the authorities. So, so that there is a continuous improvement in the uh, functioning of the industry as far as the pollution is concerned because well the authorities can tighten the standards, uh, uh, the authorities can say um, improve certain things and that becomes a renewal mechanism for the constant that every it could be one need to renew. It depends on the authorities they make it needs to be reviewed for one year, three years, five years, ten years depending on what kind of situation the person or the industry is, is in. So, you get an idea as to the industry needs to take a constant or needs to take a permission or needs to take an NOC which stands for no objection certificate. And sometimes even the NOC simply is not enough, they need to go something called EIA that stands for environmental impact assessment. That is in fact is even detailed study of the impacts of the impacts of the pollutions or the emissions and other activities on the environment as a whole. Okay, there are certain punitive measures very briefly uh, will be specifying. Uh, Non-compliance suppose the government has given the consent and within the consent there are certain conditions which industry need to follow. If they do not, it can attract punitive action from the from the government and there could be certain punishments they are, they are incorporated in the law. Apart from that, it is simply not enough to say there is a punitive measure, the industry also has certain rights and why not. And these rights will include notice of ins inspection, if suppose somebody wants to come and inspect, so formal, in formal inspection, then they need to take certain, uh, they need the information, the industry will need information. There is some, something called deemed consent, that is an important concept. Okay. It suppose the industry applies for a consent and within four months no there is no reply from the authorities then the consent becomes automatic and it becomes deemed consent and it becomes unconditional consent. The industry also has a right to appeal if they think proper justice is not done to them uh, or the conditions have been very stringent or uh, something cannot be justified they can appeal to an appellate authority that is again created as per the provisions of the Water Act. And then there is the opportunities for them to file the objection against suppose industry is directed the closure, then they can go to the um, proper um, authority to say well the closure is not quite right or they can explain the situation and then proper action or, or no action can be taken as far the closure is concerned. So, these are the, the mechanisms and ways in which the, the Water Pollution Act is being implemented in the country. Well, we move on. Similarly, there is another provision in the Water Cess Act. That is act came in 1977 as you can see here. If the purpose of the cess or the cess means here basically essentially a small levy or charge on the amount of the water consumed. Sometimes there is a confusion as whether it is water consumed or water or wastewater discharged. So, here essentially we are talking on the water uses. Okay. So, objective was, objective here is not to collect the money, okay. but objective is that if you are charged certain money you will have the, uh, you will try your everything best to conserve the water because you know there is something like electricity, you pay for the electricity. So, here also you are paying more and more for the more and more water uses. So, there will be automatically there will be uh, um, ways and means the industry or the person will think about how to use, how to minimize the water uses and also this becomes additional resource for the pollution control boards. Responsibility for the uh, responsibility obligation for the industry. 
let's write in the bracket industry okay they need to file a return okay file what it says return similar to what we, we we file a return to the income tax so similarly industry need to file a return on the water cess okay and that the deadline is may 15 they also need to provide the water meters so that we know exactly how much the water is being consumed even if somebody is not using the water from the lakes or from the river even if they are using the ground water okay the ground water also come in the ambit of uh, water cess act so you can't say, well, I'm not using the resources uh, in terms of the river or lakes, but again, the groundwater is not the sole authority, is, is not the sole um, resource that you can use independently. Groundwater is, is, is there for everyone to use. So even if somebody is using the groundwater, this comes under the ambit of Water Access Act. And access to the relevant information and ins inspection that the, uh, the authorities can ask for. The rights rights for whom? Rights for the industry again. Okay. There is a 20 percent rebate on CES when the consumes less than specified water. There are certain water quantities that have been specified in the industry using less than that. There could be a rebate of 25 percent. Complying with all the standards, okay, they, then also they can get certain rebates and then if there is a if the industry feels there is some injustice or industry feels they have been wrongly charged when it came to the water cess or the water levy or the water tax, then they can make an appeal and get the, um, get the redress of them. Okay, uh, quickly to indicate as to what are the industries which comes into the category of the Water Cess Act or where the Water Cess Act will be. In fact, all kinds of major industries as you can see as I put the arrow down, okay, all the industries come under the Water Cess Act. So, it could be ferrous industry, non-ferrous mining, ore processing, petroleum, petrochemicals, chemical industry, ceramic, cement, the textile industries and in fact, this list is even bigger, okay, pulp and paper and then you can see almost it pretty much covers almost all kinds of industry. Well, quickly uh, as to what kind of charges we are talking when it comes to the water cess. Here for example, depending on what the, what is the purpose of water that is being used for. As you can see here the heading, purpose for which water is consumed. Suppose the industrial cooling. In fact, the cooling water generally is do not get so much polluted. What it really happens is it is a temperature that goes up of the water. So, for example, if you are using the cooling water, the rate of cess okay, will be around or will be rather 1 and half pesa per kiloliter that will be the charge. Um, these uh, the interesting part about the laws is that laws can keep on changing. So, we have to keep embarrassed with the change in the laws, we have to keep updated with the laws and so it is not the science of course the science also change with time but the laws can change very quickly so for example i mean uh, let's take uh, uh, this situation okay it's just the example to demonstrate certain thing not that we are trying to um, actually uh, do the calculation or let's take another let's take the simple example here okay suppose Okay, let's do the thing. Suppose there's a, there's a steel plant, and the capacity of the steel I write here, capacity is let's say 10 million ton annual capacity of steel production. So the capacity is 10 million ton per year. Okay, and is using the water for cooling. Let's say. Okay, it's just an example that I'm I'm generating in an example for you. Is using hundred meter cube. Meter cube is same as kiloliter per ton of steel. So cess or the tax that industry will pay will be equal to for the cooling water. How much is one and a half pesa? 
So, in terms of rupees, it will be 0 0.015 times how much water they are using? 100 meter cube or 100 kiloliters per ton. How much tons they are making? 10 into 10 to the power 6 or the billion ton. So, this actually will I will make this one clear to indicate that this is uh, this actually 5. So, let us not get confused. Okay. So, this comes out to be number which will be if you show the calculation 3 digits will go away from here. So, you have 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay. The 1, 5, So, this will be in fact, this will be nearly 1.5 crore rupees. It is a, it's a, it's a big amount. So, industry would rather make sure that it is using less and less water. So, so these are the charges or these are the cess, cess uh, money or the tax or levy that can one can calculate and that the industry has to pay. So, obviously, if there is so much money that industry need to pay, they would rather control, minimize the sources, uh, minimize the water uses and then save the money because after all it is all the economics that that drive the operation of the industry. So, it, it is in fact makes sense, it is rather uh, useful to minimize the water uses and save money as it did. So, these calculations can be done and this, this column is another one here, the heading here. People need to, people will pay more okay, and then you see star here and the, the footnote here underneath the table. The rate shall be applicable only in case of the non-compliance because there could be other laws, other conditions. Suppose they are not meeting those conditions, then the, the charges would even go up. As you can see from 1 and half paisa, this can become 2 and 1 fourth paisa. Okay, that is that's a lot of money actually when, it, when we do the real uh, calculations. Well, let us uh, there are more information as to how much is the quantity of water uh, that could one use okay, and the amount uh, depending on the, the process industry, the two, uh, 20 cubic meter per, per ton. Well, we took the higher number in our calculation 100 cubic meters, but that is the uh, that is the limit. Okay. Well, let us have the further these again different kind of industries, this all information is available in the in the laws and uh, the uh, the published documents uh, from the Ministry of Environment and Forest and from the Central Pollution Control Board. Uh, just we want to quickly go over this so that there is a, there's a little feel as to uh, what kind of charges are are levied depending on what industry is uh, what industry is is in operation. Okay. There is another thing now again st staying with the environmental laws, there is another duty or another provisions in the in the act that the government has to develop the water quality criteria that becomes for the protection of the public health, protection of the ecology, similarly air quality standards, noise levels. Okay. CRZ is a very um, um, uh, coastal regulation zone in which the coastal waters are protected. Um, similarly, about the sea water quality. So, here the certain norms must be specified, so that people know are these norms being met with, are the people getting the um, desired or required water quality, air quality, noise quality and also the regulations that become very important when it comes to the development of the coastal areas. Um, this slide you see again for the water uses, uh, what uh, the central pollution control board has done is the water of the rivers okay, has been classified in 5 categories A, B, C, D, E. These categories refer to the what are the water uses or the best water use the water available in the river can be put to. For example, if you have very high quality of the water okay, or, or you wish to have the high quality of water, so designated best use will be 
the drinking without conventional TR stands for treatment, but after disinfection. The water quality is so good that you can you do not need to do any treatment, just do some disinfection, maybe chlorination, uh, ozonation, and one can use the water. So, that is category A, B, C, D, and E. So, what the Central Pollution Control Board has done is classified the rivers depending on the classes, okay, depending on the what kind of water quality they want. For example, we want to maintain a water quality in certain stretch of the river or the entire stretch of the river, which is healthy for the bathing. Okay. It is it's in our culture, it is in our ethos for the mass bathing the river that is that's very uh, religiously very important for us. So, bathing quality of the river must be maintained um, almost in all rivers. So, that is so for in order for having uh, uh, water to be to be of the quality that one person can go and take bath. So, what is that quality? So, these qualities are defined that becomes in the next slide. So, for example, bathing because we will not have the time to go through the all the uh, um, details here. So, DO stands for dissolved oxygen, it should be more than 5 more than or equal to 5 milligrams per liter. BOD which is indicator of bio, uh, organic pollution should be less than or equal to 3 milligrams per liter. Coliform MPN stands for most probable number coliform is indicating of bacteriological pollution. So, the coliform number count should be less than 500 per 100 ml and then the pH which is again you all will recall from your high school time pH shows the acidity alkalinity of the water in the in, in, the, in the broad sense I mean. So, or essentially it shows the hydrogen ion concentration that you will recall I am sure you recall pH is log of H n concentration, log is to the base 10 and H is the concentration H plus is the concentration of H ions when expressed in moles per liter. Okay. Uh, similarly, the water quality requirement will not be so stringent if the purpose of the river or purpose of the water is for the irrigation, cooling and controlled waste disposal. And but however, as I, I again say environmental laws are not the fixed entities, they keep on changing. So, we should be always we keep ourselves update, updated with the environmental laws. In fact, these laws are also being revised and being changed. So, how the pollution control is being planned or is planned is that for example, this is some river that is flowing here and suppose this is the in fact, this is the river Yamuna. Here you see here the quality of the water is E actual and the desired is C. So, that way uh, we can very quickly understand where and how the, the problem exists because this is what is the desired. Okay. Use classified or as you can see the desired and the here is the, the, the red line what you see is the E category as we defined last time is actual. For example, this is a little old slide we do not know what actual situation is right now, but this is from the water quality profile of river Yamuna. So, you can see very quickly with these maps, we can find out what are the actual levels and what are the desired levels. And the difference or the gap between the actual level and the desired level is indicative as to what we need to do and what we need to improve. Well, let us still uh, environmental laws do not end there. The Air, Air Act came in 1981 okay, for the control of air pollution. Again, it was very similar to the Water Act, but the water in fact is replaced by air. Again, it needed control, abate and prevent air pollution to preserve the and restore the national air quality, set air quality standards and criteria and the noise pollution control or noise pollution is part of the Air Act that came through an amendment. Again, polluter spay principle, command and control, and other pipe treatment that is being talked about in the Air Act. Responsibilities very similar to the um, Air, similar to Water Act, consent to establish, consent to operate, and the renewal of the consent. consent. So, they are the very similar kind of concept here when it came to the air pollution. Well, we will skip this slide. 
But in spite of having these laws, what happened, a very tragic thing happened in India was on the night of 2nd morning, 2nd December in the morning or 3rd December in Bhopal and that was the Bhopal gas tragedy took place and that it caused very serious problem and it was almost the entire country was shocked with such an industrial accident. So, in fact, uh, more than 400 people were dead, hundreds and thousands were injured and the country was shocked and then it was realized, well, we have the water act, we have the air act and yet something of this size and dimension can happen. So, and then one more accident which was which is reported was in December 4, 1985. It happened in New Delhi. Um, there was a widespread panic that was for sure and then, then this resulted in that we need to change the laws and the laws keep on changing depending on the need and the um, situation or the demand from the people for the cleaner environment. So, this law was most comprehensive and powerful act came in 1986. In this law, the, the implementing, implementing authorities had the, had the powers for the closure order, ban on the raw material supply and the focus from is slightly shifted from just water and air to the hazardous waste because hazardous waste can cause serious problem within a short time. Okay. Management and handling, it, it become focus on manufacture, storage and import of hazardous chemicals okay, because well these chemicals could be some of the chemicals are so hazardous that if they come in the environment they can certainly cause serious problem and the, even the deaths and death of not one, but several people. So, the focus became this one. The another important thing came out of this um, Environmental Protection Act is the environmental clearance procedures okay, and for the new projects and that is called EIA requirements. So, to uh, briefly we will discuss uh, some of these um, uh, the the rules or the new legal provisions that came out of the Environmental Protection Act. So, let us see some of them. Uh, the first and one of the important uh, legislation that is that that kind of what is the offshoot of the um, Environmental Protection Act is the manufacture, storage and import of hazardous chemicals. The act also defines the things, what are the extremely toxic chemicals, what are the highly toxic chemicals and they are decided on the basis of certain parameters called LD50. Okay. What is LD50 really is? It stands for lethal dose at which lethal dose of the chemical at which 50 percent of test animals, they are mostly fishes. The certain kind of fishes that can be used for this kind of test will, will die. Okay. So, that decides the, um, well we should not only say here die, in a specified time. So, that decides the how toxic and how um, difficult uh, from the environmental point of view the chemical is. You can quickly see this thing again and in fact, depending on the, it is not only just the toxicity, it could be flammability of the uh, chemical that is very, that could be important. There are certain explosive chemicals, they can be, uh, that comes under the ambit of this act. So, in fact, the, 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 um, the documents concerning this uh, law, uh, this rule, uh, the rules list 434 chemicals and specify the quantity that can be stored. Okay. This for example, this is one of the examples is there. So, if you do not store much and you have to store it with the proper um, precautions, proper um, care, then you can store. But again, you cannot store more than specified quantity. So, that you know like even if suppose 
by chance there is some accident, the dimension of the problem will not be so severe and it will be manageable, it will be one can tackle it with, with the efforts and with the uh, facilities available well within the plant. So, still staying with the chemical rules, okay, uh, what are the obligations, what industry need to do is to identify the major accidents, what could happen, hazards related to the industrial activity, to prevent, uh, to provide relevant information to the persons liable to be affected, is suppose a large industry near, near, near some colony or the, where the people are living, it is obligatory for the industry to specify and say, well, they are operating such and such process, they are using such and such chemicals, which are toxic and can cause the problem. Safety sheets need to be maintained and label the specified information on every container of hazardous chemicals. So, we know exactly what is stored in case of the accident, in case of a situation which is um, untoward or some difficult situation, we know what kind of chemical is stored and what needs to be done quickly to minimize its impact. Responsibilities for the industry, safety reports, they have to maintain both off site and on site. Prepare up to date on site emergency plan in case things go wrong. Maintain records of the import of the imports of the hazardous chemicals. Ensure transportation of hazardous substance as per the provisions of the Motor Vehicle Act of 1988. There are the ways in which the hazardous chemicals can be transported and that must be followed properly. Similarly, there are the rules for the waste management, hazardous waste. See earlier what we are talking about the hazardous chemicals and here what we are talking is the hazardous waste. Obtain the authorization for handling the hazardous waste from the authorities. Apply for renewal of the authorization if the authorization expires. Maintain records of hazardous waste handling and amount that is generated. Submit annual returns, the way you file your income tax return and you are operating an industry, you better file the um, return on the amount of the hazardous waste that is generated and all of the information that is required. Report to pollution control board any accident at the site or during transportation, that is very important. Import of the hazardous waste to follow specific procedures, so that need to be followed, you just cannot import the hazardous waste that is for the reprocessing from another country is here. So, that also has certain procedures that need to be followed. Okay, what are the rights for the industry is an authorization for a period of 2 years is generally given, but this is not always guaranteed. Opportunity for hearing state government to identify the sites for the disposal of the hazardous waste because hazardous waste needs to be disposed of properly and of course, as per the other laws the right to appeal to the authorities. The waste categories have been defined, okay. the category 1, 2 to 18 categories have been defined and what it really means, the category 1 is the uh, category in which the cyanide waste is there, category 2 metal finishing, waste containing water soluble heavy metals and all. So, you can see that depending on what category there is a certain amount of the regulatory quantities that one can handle and one can produce and dispose of. So, again that is driven and that is decided by the law. So, the laws have become very stringent now with time and constantly changing, I say it again and again because no law is, is fixed. There is another law which again industry need to follow is the Public Liability Insurance Act that came in 1991. What is the purpose is that the every industry need to buy an insurance, it is something similar to you are driving a car and you need to buy an insurance because you can injure, you can, you can you can you can meet with the accident and you need to pay someone you injure because of you somebody got injured then you need to pay then then insurance company you can pay so you have to buy out an insurance so the idea was to provide relief okay to provide relief as specified in case of death or injury to any person or damage to property from an accident occurring while handling a specified hazardous substance. So, that there is some form the money is available. Of course, I mean one should take every effort that no accident occurs, but in case if there is, there should be a proper mechanism to quickly provide a relief 
to the people. Okay? So, that comes a mechanism here. And then to draw the insurance policies by the industry more than the paid up capital of undertaking, but less than 50 crore rupees. Let us read it again. To draw insurance policies which could be more than paid up capital of undertaking, but should be equal to the paid up capital or, but it should be less than 50 crore rupees. So, you buy the insurance and obviously, to pay the amount of an award as specified by, by the district magistrate and collector in case if there is an accident, in case somebody suffered because of the accident that took place in the industry. Obviously, the idea here is to that money be available in case of emergency, but you will see here as, as, a, as we can understand this concept as we are driving the car and then we become very careful because we know that if we make an accident, we will cause more problem in terms of insurance will go up. So, you better be careful and not, not cause an accident. So, similarly, the industry also is under pressure in a way to perform better so that their insurance policies or insurance uh, installments do not go up. Very important act and very useful act. So, there are certain opportunity, the rights opportunity of hearing by the district collector before awarding the amount of relief to the people who suffered because of the accident, opportunities to file objections against the proposed directions in the specified form within a specified time. So, industry also can make an appeal and look for the redressal. There is also a requirement that every industry must submit an environmental statement by September 30 to state pollution control. What it what it needs to specify the water and raw material consumption quantities, the pollution discharges in terms of the water and air, hazardous waste information, solid waste, waste characteristics and measures taken to prevent natural resources. Okay, the another important um, uh, legislation that have come into and that is again offshoot of um, Environmental Protection Act of 1986 is the biomedical waste. Okay. What one would realize is the hospitals, okay, whether it is the um, human or human hospital or the veterinary hospitals, they generate lot of waste water, uh, they generate a lot of waste and that need to be disposed. This waste can be very harmful because it could be infectious waste and that can cause serious problem. So, for that again there are certain laws, the waste can be generated during the diagnostic, during the treatment, during the immunization and on the animal research and that waste needs to be disposed of. And there could be waste coming from the hospital, the shops, the doctors or the surgeons use the, the tools for surgery, that could be soiled waste, there could be other disposable, there could be anomatic waste, anatomic waste, there will be some cultures, discarded medicines some medicines expired and that needs to be discarded, there could be some body parts that seem to be disca discarded and that all become biomedical waste and there has to be the laws and rules to handle the biomedical waste. So, biomedical waste also for the purpose of uh, the implementation has been categorized into certain categories and some of the categories are, are specified as you see on your screen okay, is the human and anatomic waste is one category animal waste is a second kind of category, microbiological or biotechnological biotech waste is another category, waste that is sharp like the knives and the other tools which the surgeon use, because at some point the, those need to be disposed of. So, what is the most important thing is that you do not want to mix these waste, mix, no. Okay. So, then if you do not mix then you segregate it that is what is the, the law says. Segregate and in order for not to having any confusion, segregate in the bags which are of different colors. Okay. So, that one would know where this waste is coming from and especially see the other issue with the biomedical waste is suppose there is some infectious waste. So, if you mix that waste with other waste, all other waste will become infectious and people who are handling the waste or the people uh, being disposed of on the land side, la landfill side or the rack pickers can pick up certain things and they can get the disease because of the biomedical waste that is spreading around. So, there is a need to proper collection, proper treatment 
and then the proper disposal. So, what are the uh, ways and means to handle the uh, biomedical waste? There is incineration, certain amount of the waste which can be burnt simply, S there are certain waste could which could be disinfected and then disinfected waste can be mixed with the municipal waste. Then there is no fear of getting the infection from the biomedical waste. Then again all the hospitals, large hospitals must obtain a um, authorization from the state pollution control board and they must follow the rules and regulation specified for the biomedical waste rule. This has become very important and almost all this all the hospitals in the country are now following the uh, biomedical waste rules and it is it is very important for our public health for the people at large that no infectious waste is comes out from the hospitals and uh, it does not cause any other serious problem uh, for the people who are handling the waste or or the people at large. Okay, there is another uh, very powerful uh, means for the pollution control in the country is called public interest litigation. I am sure we all hear this in the newspaper and the actions being taken by the by the by the courts and what it what what it says in fact the Supreme Court of India has expanded the scope of the boundaries of the fundamental right of life and personal liberty as guaranteed in article 21 of the constitution of India. So, the, 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 the guarantee which the constitution gives to us for the personal liberty and uh, personal liberty and right of life is simply not just live you know um, uh, you need you, you uh, the life uh, right to life with the proper environment and the clean environment. So, if in some, some sense if this, um, uh, this uh, fundamental right is infringed with then there has to be some action mechanism that is put into place and that comes through public interest litigation. The court has interpreted the right of life okay, and personal liberty to include the right to a wholesome environment or the clean and the proper environment. If suppose that uh, that environment is not clean, it means in a way the court can interpret this as the infringement okay, of the fundamental right to live in personal liberty, which is a very strong and uh, powerful uh, interpretation the, the our courts have given and that in fact has, uh, has uh, 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 kind of uh, stimulated the general people at large and many public interest litigations have been filed and it has, uh, it has re resulted in clean environment, many of the cleaner process. In fact, we have some of the examples as you can see here, some of the important PILs are the gas leak from the Shiram food fertilizers in Delhi in 1985 that became the subject of PIL, H acid industry in Udaipur, air polluting industries in West Bengal including some of the oil refineries, hazardous industries in Delhi became the PIL because people thought if there is hazardous industry it could be harmful and it could be dangerous. Common effluent treatment plants in Delhi, H acid industry in Ratlam, some many, many um, PILs are, are, are filed in Taj uh, in Agra to protect the Taj and many other things example you see here that has resulted in very quick decisions and it has uh, the people have become very active and participating in the PILs and that could lead to a very healthy and very good environment. Mm -hmm.